Over the last 40 years, the communist-led People's Republic of China has become a consumer paradise. Today, in the streets of its great cities, you can see all the goods of the world on show. And that was true for much of China's earlier history. When Marco Polo came here to Hangzhou in the 13th century, he was amazed by the consumer choices on display. There were shops selling beauty products, makeup, face cream, eyeliner, false hair. You could buy pets, pet cats, cat baskets, special food. You could buy fishing tackle and games, playing cards, chessmen, darts. Chinese, Marco Polo thought, were a nation with entrepreneurship coursing through their veins. But after the communist revolution, China rejected capitalism. Business became a dirty word, and 40 years ago, none of this existed. So how did this great transformation happen? This is Guangzhou on the Pearl River, China's historic commercial capital. Romans, Arabs, and Persians traded here in ancient times. But after 1949, China turned its back on making money. When you came here 40 years ago, what you saw was a skyline of decaying factories with old-fashioned machinery, poor infrastructure, almost no cars in the streets. Guangzhou, said a local Communist Party official, has become the tired old man of the Pearl River Delta. And the reason was very simple. What good is production without consumers? My first visit to China was 1973. And at that time, I remember in Guangzhou, there were still dog carts. There were a lot of people without clothes who were so thin that you could not, uh, you know, wondered if they were going to make it. Then, in 1978, Deng Xiaoping emerged as China's new leader, and his bid to modernize the country began here in the south. A short drive into the Pearl River Delta, and you can look straight across to Hong Kong, then still under British rule. 40 years ago, this was the promised land. This strait was the gateway to a better life for vast numbers of poor Chinese, whose dreams of wealth often ended in bitter disappointment and even in tragedy. Deng Xiaoping was briefed on the situation here on a visit to Guangdong at the end of 1977. 700,000 people, mainly young men, he was told, had attempted to cross over to Hong Kong, many of them swimming directly across. 140,000 made it. Most were turned back, but many drowned. One of the coves here became known as the Cove of Corpses. The reasons for the migration, of course, were economic. You could earn over there 100 times the daily wage of a laborer here in Guangzhou. And the solution, as Deng Xiaoping had long known, was reform to better the lives of the people of China. So the reform would start here in the south, in Guangdong. Beginning in this one region with its immense economic potential, Deng made plans to lift the whole country. He found an ally in the new boss of Guangdong, an old revolutionary comrade who shared his views on reform. Xi Zhongshun, father of today's president, Xi Jinping. In fact, Xi Zhongshun was already making deals with local business. Here in Shenzhen, on what was then just a rocky promontory opposite Hong Kong, one local entrepreneur proposed a business plan involving foreign investment, a no-go since 1949. He had a plan, 
to create a breaker's yard here where old Chinese merchant vessels, and there were lots of them, would be broken to pieces and sold as scrap metal to Hong Kong merchants the other side of the water to feed the construction boom over there. Now, of course, there, there was no space for such an enterprise, but there was here. So on the 31st of January 1979, barely a month since the plenum meeting in the Jinxi Hotel in Beijing, the deal was signed. The first foreign investment contract in the history of the People's Republic of China. And it's amazing to think that then there was nothing here at all. And just look at it now. Central government has no money, Deng said to Xi, but we can devise a policy that will allow you to forge ahead. Let's call it a special economic zone. This was totally typical of Deng Xiaoping's approach. They set up these four experimental zones near Hong Kong and Macau. And they permitted market forces to operate in those zones, but not elsewhere in the country. And when the zones were wildly successful, in large measure because Hong Kong took advantage of the cheap labor available on the mainland and moved their production facilities into these special zones. And this then became the model for the entire country. Soon, the entire country was on the move. A great change in history had begun, and it came not just from top down, but from the bottom up. Fueling Deng's reform, millions of small businesses sprang up across China, and nowhere more so than a historic city on the coast of Zhejiang, Wenzhou. You can see how Wenzhou's been shaped by geography, hemmed in by the mountains, cut off from the interior. It's always been an outward-looking place. From the Sung Dynasty onwards in the 1200s, its merchants have sailed down the river, up the coast to the Yangtze Delta and on to Vietnam. In the 19th century, when the Europeans established their treaty ports, Wenzhou people went out to southern Europe. Today, 90% of the Chinese people in Italy are descended from Wenzhou. So when the great opening up happened 40 years ago, this city with its clan-based businesses was ideally situated to take advantage of the new opportunities. And Wenzhou was the first city in China to establish a system of small private enterprise. Wenzhou would be the birthplace of China's private economy, with 130,000 small businesses, from noodle bars to China's first private airline. But the first private business certificate in 1979 was issued to a young woman selling knitting in the street, and she's still here. So how did you get into buttons then? How did the button story come? Hollywood Through the 1980s, the reform took root across China. No one had seen anything like this in history before. The energies of the Chinese people had been liberated, as Deng had hoped. Almost overnight, Shenzhen became a city of 13 million people. Now the symbol of Chinese capitalism it even opened a stock exchange. The 
Brown was a pragmatist. His famous quote, you know, is it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white, if it catches rats, it's a good cat. And he was experimental in, in looking for the best way to accomplish something. The ideological tensions, though, were still huge. Dung was accused of betraying the revolution as he had been in his earlier career. And before he retired, he made a famous journey to rally the South, the dynamo of the reform process. And they did. Today, the Pearl River Delta is the world's biggest business and manufacturing hub, responsible for a quarter of all China's exports. If it was a separate country, it would be third in the world behind the USA and Germany. And after the manufacturing companies came the new technologies. So 1999, uh, that's the, the time when Alibaba was founded. Uh, the name that's always linked to the story, uh, Open Sesame. Uh, so Open Sesame, that means like uh, how we can, uh, from very beginning, our mission is to make it easy to do business anywhere, open the treasure. Across the whole world. Exactly, okay. Maybe like people have not realized, Alibaba from day one is a kind of globalization of uh, the symbol. Because the first website of Alibaba is uh, in English. And globalization is the goal now, through China's Belt and Road Initiative, linking the trade of Asia and Europe by land and sea. Only 40 years ago, this was just a scrubby shoreline in the Pearl River Delta. From the corner button shop in Wenzhou to this giant container port, modern China has come a long way. Right back in the Middle Ages, Chinese junks and Arab dolls carried the produce of China, tea and silk and especially ceramics to the Persian Gulf in the West. And now they're doing it again. From these container ports, uh, ships are flooding across the world. And wherever you live, whether you're in the States or Africa or Asia, there'll be something here that ends up on your table.